you know the story of the quail. It leaves its ancestral territory, which is a field, newly plowed, and wanders outside and gets caught by a hawk. And this is being carried off. It laments, oh, my lack of merit. If I only I'd stayed in my ancestral territory, I, this hawk would have been no match for me. You can imagine what the hawk thinks about this little tiny quail saying something like that. So the hawk says, okay, go ahead, go back to your territory, but even there you won't be safe from me. So the quail goes back, stands on a stone that's been turned up by a plow, and taunts the hawk, come and get me, come and get me. The hawk dives down again, and as it's coming full speed, the quail hides behind the stone. The hawk can't stop in time, and so it crashes his breast on the stone. And as the Buddha said to the monks, if you wander outside your territory, that's wandering in beautiful sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, you're going to get caught by Mara. Now, Mara here, of course, is not something outside. It's your own defilements. Your own greed, aversion, and delusion will catch you. And what do they do when they catch you? They make you do unskillful things. That's our big fear. That we can't trust ourselves not to do unskillful things. You think about what's going to happen in society if this quarantine lasts for a long time. There's going to be a lot of hardship. When there's a lot of hardship, people do a lot of unskillful things. And for your own safety, you want to make sure you are not one of those people. So you've got to stay in your territory. And what is your territory? It's the establishing of mindfulness. Now these establishings are not just body, feelings, mind, mental qualities, because those things can turn on you if you have the wrong attitude toward them. It's the attitude you take that makes them your territory, safe territory. You focus on them in and of themselves, like the body in and of itself. If you think about the body in terms of the world as your tool for getting things out of the world, and then all of a sudden the tool is being taken away from you. It grows ill, it ages, it dies. You can start doing some very unskillful things. So you're ardent to develop only skillful qualities, skillful thoughts around the body, and to abandon unskillful ones. You're alert to what's actually going on in the mind with regard to the body. And you keep in mind that you want to get the best things out of the body before you have to let it go. The same with your feelings, the same with your mind states. You look at these things just in and of themselves and not in reference to the world. Anytime the mind wanders out into the world to think about the body in the world or your feelings in the world or your mind in the world, you say, that's outside of my territory. I'm going to look after what I've got here. But you can think of that field, not simply as newly plowed. It's a place where you can plant things. You can plant concentration. You can plant discernment. For instance, with concentration, you can give rise to a sense of well-being inside the body that doesn't have to depend on the world outside. The mind gets to settle down. And in the beginning, it's taken with the breath. As I said this morning, try to savor your breath. Enjoy it. Get as sensitive as you can to the breath, because that's going to help the mind settle down even more. Make yourself a connoisseur of the breath. Now, ultimately, even breathing gets labor laborious as the mind gets very, very subtle. The breath gets more subtle until it stops. 
but you've still got the body. You've got the breath energy filling the body. And if you've been working with it properly, there's a sense of everything in the body is all connected, which is why you don't need to breathe. And even though this is described as a state of equanimity, there's a strong sense of well-being. This is an innocent pleasure. A pleasure is, as John Fung used to say, it's the grass at the gate. The image being of a herd of cows being kept inside a corral. The owner opens up the gate and the cows go running out to find grass out in the meadow. And they don't notice the grass that's right next to the gate. But the fact that you've got this safe territory here, and it's right near you, you want to make the most of that. Because the more you spread yourself out in the world, the more you leave yourself exposed. It's like those old strategy games you used to play when you were a child. You had to realize that the more territory you own, the more you're open to attack. The more things you lay claim to outside, the more your attachments are going to get you to do whatever is possible and hold on to those attachments. And again, that's a source of your not being able to trust yourself. So try to focus your search for happiness inside. And as for the thoughts that go out in involved in greed and distress with reference to the world, learn to cut them off, because that's where your attachments are going to be. And wherever there's an attachment, there's a possibility of being threatened. Where there is a sense of being threatened, there's a part of you that you can't trust. You don't know what you would do to hold on to that. But if you learn how to let go, you become more trustworthy. Because ultimately, that's the big fear in life, or it should be the big fear in life. If everyone lived with that as their major fear, the world would be a much better place. The fear of doing something unskillful, based on an attachment. So you have to understand, this is where your fears come from. You're holding on to your body, you're holding on to your feelings, you're holding on to certain mind states with the wrong attitude. It's the right attitude toward these things that makes the body, feelings, mind states your safe territory. In other words, anything unskillful comes up with regard to these things, you do your best to let it go. Anything skillful comes up, you do your best to maintain it. That's what the ardency is all about, and that's the ardency in that that is your protection. So focus your efforts, focus your desire for happiness right here. It's one of the reasons that they have the eight precepts for the lay people. On the days when you take the eight precepts, all of a sudden you realize there are certain things you can't do, certain avenues for finding pleasure that are closed. And so you look inside. And if you're wise, you learn to appreciate the potentials you have here. You read about all these people who are suffering from the lockdown, suffering from the quarantine. They can't get to do the things they wanted to do. They're shut up with a lot of other people in small spaces in some cases. And the reason they're suffering is because they lack skill. They look past the potentials they have inside. They're realizing that their safe territory is in here, because this is something that nobody can take away from you, even if they quarantine you, even if they shut you up in solitary confinement. You've still got your body, your feelings, your mind, and you can regard them with mindfulness, alertness, ardency. Make them your safe place to be. And continue the image of the field, you can cultivate the field and give rise to a sense of well-being. 
both the well-being that comes from concentration and the well-being that comes from discernment as you begin to see things you're holding on to that you don't need to. You can let them go, let them go. So cultivate your field. Don't leave it fallow. You leave it fallow, you start looking for food in other people's fields. And that takes you out into the world again. And then there are going to be conflicts over whose field is whose field, whose food is whose food. And that's why we suffer. So look inside. Establish the mind in its territory, the right attitude toward the body, the right attitude towards feelings of the mind. And it's here that your true refuge will be found. Because we don't just stay here, we cultivate this. And as we cultivate it, we gain the discernment. And the discernment itself is not the goal. It's not that we're here to arrive at insights. We use the insights in order to free the mind. Since you let go even of the concentration, you bring the mind to a point where it can even let go of its discernment and not fall back. At that point, as the Buddha says, we who have nothing have nothing to fear. When you find the deathless, it comes from not holding on to anything, not having anything as a belonging in that state. That's when you find somebody you can really trust. But to get to that, you have to make yourself trustworthy. Think about the soldiers that they train to be willing to give up all kinds of things. The more the soldiers are willing to give up, the more they can be trusted. Now the problem with training soldiers like that is after the battle is over, then they let them loose and do whatever what they want because their needs have, or what they their desires have been suppressed for a while. But if you want to be one of the Buddhist soldiers, you don't just suppress your desires, you understand them to the point where you realize anything that pulls you out outside of your safe territory is going to make you someone you can't trust. And you learn how to see through the causes for those desires, and you can let them go. So then holding on to nothing, it's not the case that you have nothing. There's a huge reward. But to get there, you have to learn how to make yourself trustworthy. So you see yourself thinking about something unskillful or about to say something unskillful or about to do something unskillful. You have to ask yourself, here I am living in a very comfortable place like this. Things haven't gotten really bad yet. Here I already I'm giving in to unskillful desires. What's going to happen when things get worse? It's when you're true to yourself, even in the littlest things. That the really good, true, big things will come your way.